Hello everyone and welcome to another unboxing and today for you we're unboxing Bloodborne the board game and I apologise in advance if at any time I accidentally say Blood Bowl took me long enough to say Blood Bowl instead of Bloodborne and now I have to go back the other way but anyway this is the miniature game released by Come On Games Cool Mini or Not via Kickstarter I think it's going, going full retail eventually but this is the Kickstarter version so we're going to be unboxing the board game itself but also this is the Full Moon expansion, I think it was called, sorry, the Blood Moon expansion, which includes some additional stuff. So we'll quickly preview those, but we are going to start with the core box. But the Blood Moon also includes Murgo's Loft and then the actual Blood Moon box itself, which is Kickstarter, Stretch Goals, and then the Chalice Dungeon expansion as well. But we'll look at all those in time. Bloodborne is one of my favourite video games ever. It's my favourite Souls-esque game for those of you who know what that means. And I'm looking forward to getting started and looking at what's in this. So before we get cracked into this, we can take a look at the site here. It's for one to four players, 14 plus, average game, an hour to an hour and a half. Although from what I've seen of people already playing their version, you're looking at less than that, generally, if you're playing solo, that is. And uniquely, as I get the lid off this, this is a miniatures game, and the miniatures do actually play a part, unlike some of Kamon's games, where I honestly feel like they're just tacked on for stretch goals. Um, they matter here, and also this game has no dice. It is a non-dice game. Free Kamon content. Eh. So we do have a rulebook. I have seen some feedback on the rulebook. It is short, relatively speaking. We're talking 27 pages, including glossary. And that means that the rules are succinct, but there is a little bit of interpretation required, a little bit of confusion from what I've seen, but apparently an FAQ is being worked on. And with a lot of these things, especially if you're playing solo, you can house roll, honestly. So there's a little preview of the miniatures that it comes with, as well as the many bits of card, because again, there's no dice, it's a, it's a card-based system. Uh, almost a deck builder, but not something like Slay the Spire. It's simpler than that, but you use cards to initiate everything. There's no... Well, there is some random chance in terms of what the AI does, but because of the way the AI deck is built, there's actually some structure to it as well, which is actually quite clever. And there's a lot of stuff I know from this game that I really wish the Dark Souls board game had used instead of the systems they'd used, but we can go into more details about that either as we get into this or once we eventually play it as well. Oh, hey, it's my weapon of choice in New Game. My New Game Plus weapon of choice is the Burial Blade. So we have the first of many tokens, including some NPC ones for Aline the Clo Crow, Alfred, Bloody Crow, Henrik, Eoska, which I never remember that's the correct pronunciation. I remember my my Twitch chat telling me off for never pronouncing that correctly. We have some insight tokens, we have some blood tokens, and uh, echoes, blood echoes, otherwise known as souls, between every game. Good quality card, as expected. And then this is the crux of how the game is played. It's played on these boards. There's a certain random nature to the missions you do, but some are set. The icons on the boards denote either enemy spawns, item spawns, or other such things like events in the top left. Not confusing to play, and in general, you won't have that large of a an exploration area, because there's also a time element to the game, since you can die and respawn. <laughs> So the, you, you have a literal ticking clock to determine whether or not you fail. So these are actually falling out of this. But that's okay. Let's, let's just batter four of these out and take a look at these. The Grand Cathedral where you fight Vicar Amelia. Presumably. Well, in the game you do. And that's just the back because sometimes you randomise. Well, every mission involves randomising the route. And then you draw a card. And then kind of like the Dark Souls miniature game, you can place it where there's an adjoining door. Wait, Church of the Good Chalice? Maybe that's where you fight Vicar Amelia. No, isn't that from the DLC? <laughs> Forgive me, I haven't played, like, Bloodborne is one of my favourite games ever, but I haven't played it for, like, a few years at this point. I was hoping for a PS5, like, upscaled re-release to give me an excuse to play it again. Wooden Chapel? I think that's where you send all the NPCs if you don't want them to get devoured. Enemy attacks suffer minus one, I believe that's speed. While on this tile. And then we do have a bunch of others, many, many, many tiles. They're going to fall out 
if I look at them individually, but there's a lot of them. And the central lamp is where you spawn. So I'm put that to one side for now. Oh, there's more. Graveyard, courtyard, alleyway. Ah, here we go. So this is our main... I'm surprised this isn't thick cardboard. This is actually... It's kind of thin. Free digital gift, I'm sure. So this is kind of like one of the main playboards. When you're setting up a, a, a mission scenario, you, it goes in chapters. So you put your active chapter card there. This is the Hunter's Dream where you go by choice to upgrade or when you die. And you have upgrade cards that you mix into your deck and then you take away a basic card. This along here is the timer. You start here, go to the Hunter's Dream or die. It takes a long one, end of turn, takes a long one. Enemies respawn or get back all their health only on the red pips. So unlike the Dark Souls miniature game, they don't instantly go back to full health if you die, which is a fantastic twist. And then depending on the chapter you're playing, these symbols denote enemies. You slot the enemy stat cards here, and then if you find these icons on the scenario, you spawn whatever enemy this scenario dictates onto them. So it's a clever system, honestly. I'm not too sure about the ticking clock, but I understand why it has to be a thing. Because you're immoral, essentially, because you just die and respawn. So these are the minis themselves in here. Welcome home, good hunter. Ooh, sorry for the noise. So, we have our hunter miniatures over there. We have the large lads down here and we have some... I don't know what the, what the proper name is. I mean, they go in the bases of the hunters. Do they have a proper name, those things? So let's take a look at all the hunters. So we've got the, the Holy Blade miniature here. A little bit smaller than I was expecting, but when you see some of the monsters, they're a lot larger. And then we've got the Starter Axe, the Noob Crutch. Start with this and just two-hand everything if you want an easy time at the start of the game. Secondary, secondarily, you would have, oh yep, the Saw Blade, and he's wearing the box art. It's, it's cool looking. Very nice. And then, what have we got here? Ooh, a slightly bent threaded cane and the cannon. Cannon's a late game gun. I'm surprised they modeled it on someone. And then we have four of the, oh, I have no idea what the basic enemies are called from this game, but these are like the, the guys living in old Jarnum. Dime a dozen guys. So you get four of these, all identical. And then four of the larger ones who spit poison and such. Again, from Old Jarnum. Who do we have over here? Oh, we have Father Gascoigne in both forms. Neat. So this is Hunter Father Gascoigne. Which he looks like when he helps you against Cleric Beast. Yeah. And, or, and how he looks in the first phase of the fight against him. Spoilers. But then also... He gets a little bit wolfy. What's that smell? It's enough to make a man sick, etc. I like that mini, that's cool. Cool mini or not, I would say that's a cool mini. Uh, is this still taped on? Oh, it isn't! Fantastic! So then we've got the larger enemies. Oh, Vikramelia herself. The old double deer priest. Very nice looking. I can, I can hear her scream in my head just by looking at this miniature. <laughs> That's the one bad point. With, well, there, there's a few downsides to Bloodborne, but the main one, absolutely every boss screaming at you constantly. This is Bloodstar Beast for sure. Usually, like, one of the first roadblocks, because he's very annoying and poisons constantly. I'm not sure how that was slotted in. There we go. And then this is Cleric Beast. I'm actually surprised Cleric Beast is bigger than Vicar Amelia. That is a cool miniature though. Well, miniature, it's the size of my hand. Very cool though, very cool indeed. Yeah, that is a very smart looking miniature. Very impressive. Neat. So then we have four of the... Oh, slightly bent spear tip. For these guys, these are the exceptionally large guys who come out at... Well, there was like five of them in the DLC from what I remember. I think there's only like one or two in the base game. Or three if you count the ones that have the ball and chains. But yeah, very large lads. Very easy to take out once you know what they do. 
but very imposing looking. So then we have four, oh, it's, it's just a, like four trio of the, the villagers, the Yarmanites, I guess, the ones that have fallen to the, the bloodlust, etc. on the hunt. Yeah, it's neat, one of them's holding a rifle, one's got an axe, and one's holding a shield. Imagine blocking, how dare they. So then we have four of the, the larger guys who are slightly mutated that they punch you in the face over and over with the brick. Like if they get you with the first hit, then they do like six in a row. It's basically an insta-kill if you get caught in it. But they're easy to parry, once you know how to do the gun parry. Then we have four of the werewolf guys, the like feral werewolves. I think the first one you run into them, oh no, you run into two just before Cleric Beast. I remember the start of the game very well, the, the latter stages not as much. And then these are the guys who eventually get a little bit eyeball-y, depending on your insight. And come out at night once you've beaten Vicar Amelia, I think that's when, that's the trigger for the first time skip in the game. Very cool, very detailed, don't have any issue with any of these models at all. They look great! Now, can I put this safely to one side? If I put this back on, I believe I can. It's a little loud. So then we have, presumably four hunter boards, because it's four player. Yep. So this is what you use to play with your character. You put their character card there and you can flip it based on which weapon form you want to use, because the little weapons transform. You get a firearm. That's where your blood echoes go, if you kill stuff. That's where your HP goes. You hit zero, you die. You go to the Hunter's Dream. The logo on the back. Oh, in fact, here is the base box's Hunter cards. Saw Cleaver, Threaded Cane, Hunter Axe. Was it just called Hunter Axe? Hmm. And Ludwig's Holy Blade. That would be my one of choice. Each time you clear a slot, deal one damage to an enemy in your space. So yeah, you don't, you initiate attacks by placing cards you've drawn on the slots and then you have to clear them. You can clear them by burning a card to flip. Oh, only two on this side. Attacking with combo slash may transform weapon for free. Hmm. And the arrows above, all right, let's go back to this one, it's easier to see. The arrows above denote how fast they are. More arrows is better, so this is super fast. Medium speed, medium speed. And then one, was there a one here? Yeah. The overhead slam, it does four damage, super slow. And that's important because enemies attack simultaneously and if they go faster than you, they could stun you, kill you, basically stop your attack in any number of ways. So the last part of the box is many, many cards. I'm not sure we're going to go through each of these individually because of how many there are. The base box comes with three stories. There's an example, Growing Madness, The Long Hunt and Secrets of the Church. So that is a story, and it's not a story where you go through linearly. Depending on what you do, the story can change as you go. And I've seen a couple of versions of this being played, and both played out differently. So there's three campaigns in the base box. There is AI cards for the bosses. Oh, and also there's an example of a weapon card. Oh, I'm sorry, there is a fourth uh, chapter. There's Fall of Old Yarnum. It was hidden underneath the boss cards. So there's four campaigns in the base box. Then we have a massive bundle of consumables. If you've played the game, you know what consumables are. There's a good example, bone marrow ash, but stuff like antidotes, blood vials, etc. Your basic cards. So this is what your cards look like. And that's just an example of one. Basic card, you could play it or discard it and draw one to move. You have to discard to move. Uh, this is special items, so that might have some spoilers, so I don't want to talk about them. And these are the upgrade cards you can get that you mix into your deck that are generally better. So you block two damage, for instance. Although blocking in Bloodborne... Hmm. Then there's your enemy AI action cards and also enemy AI as well. There's a generic AI deck for enemies and it has... Oh, three basic, two special, one ability card, I think. And you just draw them until there's none left, then you shuffle them and, and do it again. So if you're paying attention to what's been drawn already, you can know what the enemy is going to try and do to you and use that to your advantage. So yeah, I think that's... Oh no, that's not it. Stat cards for enemies. Like that's the bloody crow of Kanehurst. Player aid. 
that's just a, a quick summary, I believe, for the rules. It's actually quite handy, that. And it will have the other monster stack cards in here as well. Uh, in fact, we can take a quick look at some of them. Yeah, so there's four player aid cards. They just tell you what stats mean and then remind you turn order and whatnot on the back. Uh, I don't want to look at the NPC cards, so we can turn this over. There's the hunter mob. That's just the basic mob. I believe you can also randomize two forms of the enemy. Yeah. So I don't know how much changes between them, but it's not a case of like you kill one side of flip still crisis protocol style. It's just to add another changed element, I guess. Some missions might specify which side you use. I, I don't know. But in general, I think you can just either randomize or pick. I don't know. It depends how much of a how much control you want over the selection, I guess. Their health's in the top right, so they've got four health. You draw from the generic AI deck. They'll tell you whether you want to do basic, special, or ability, and depending on that, it does damage, stats, etc. Huntsman's Minion is what they're called. Scourge Beast, Church Servant, Male Beast Patient, Female Beast Patient, and they again all have different sides. Church Giant cannot be staggered. And then we're into NPCs, so that, that could be spoilery. So I don't want to look at them immediately right now, but that is everything you get in the core box. Let's take a look at some of the Kickstarter stretch goals. So it's the smallest of the additional boxes. We're going to start with Murgo's Loft, which is the finale of the game, more or less. So you're getting some miniatures in here, as well as some additional cards, double-sided tiles, enemy cards, etc. It's a full campaign, two enemies, one boss. All right, let's take a little look. I like the design of Murgo's Wet Nurse, which is the boss included in this. So immediately we have some oversized tiles for the f final area of the game, more or less. So spoilers, I guess. If you haven't played the base game, there's oh, that's where you fight where Murgo's Wet Nurse. That's the boss arena. The Wet Nurse is Luminarium. Murgo's Loft, that's the route up. Including a pit. That sounds dangerous. And then we just have the minis and the cards. So that's the stack cards for Murgo's Attendance. And then her stack card. In, oh, yeah, her stack card will be in here. But here is her AI deck as well. Amount of health is similar to the Devil May Cry miniature game. Depending on the number of players, it denotes how much health bosses have. That also contains the campaign cards. I don't want that spoiled though, so I don't want to look at them. And this will be her AI deck. Yes, for phase one and phase two, it tells you what she does. Indeed. And then we have the miniatures. Simple enough. Is this cell taped on? Oh, this one is sellotaped on. I wonder if they just forgot for the other one. Luckily, I have scissors ready. Both sides, both sides. Got it. Oh, did I not fully cut one side? Oh, no, we're in. Hacker voice, we're in. So I don't really remember. I remember where you see these ladies. It's in the area that's got those pits. But the best strat for that area is just to run through. So I don't think I've ever seen what they do. But yeah, these are the, the wet nurse attendants that are just hanging out. So you get four of them, four of the tiny guys with the flails that kind of stalk you. Kind of freaky. I wouldn't trust them. And then the wet nurse herself. As I say, very cool design. This would be a nightmare to paint. <laughs> I can tell that immediately. This would be a nightmare, which is ironic, I guess. Oh, so we didn't do the, the hand cradling the invisible baby. No. They weren't allowed to put the baby in, I think, because it would be too, um, I don't know, offensive. But she's guarding the baby that you're there to kill. If you aren't aware, that's the story of Bloodborne. It's basically the world's most drawn-out abortion. Cool miniature, though. Very cool. Very stabby. Very heavy. It's a chunk of plastic. Very neat. Yeah, very cool. All right, that's one expansion. Next, have a, let's have a look at the the Blood Moon box itself, which I believe is just some additional player characters. So the Blood Moon box. Oh no, there is enemies in this, but mostly it's including some set dressing in the form of doll miniatures, lamp miniatures, and item miniatures. But it has two, four, six more player characters, one of which is using my favourite weapon, the Burial Blade, so I hope their stats are good. But there's also some enemies from... Oh, what's that area called? Oh, I can't remember. It's, it's the Dream World, but I don't remember what it's called. 
where you fight the uh, hunter must hunt guy wearing the stupid cage on his face I don't remember his name, oh that's gonna bug me ah, stack cards first, good oh, slightly creased so we have the Tonatrus, which is the electric mace character Blade of Mercy, and she's, or they, are wearing the Aline the Crow armour, which is what I wore in my blind playthrough. Ludwig's Uncanny Holy Blade. I don't remember what that is. Hmm. No, not sure. Legarius's Wheel. Yep, you can just beat people to death with a giant wheel that saps your strength, if I remember rightly. The Kirkhammer, nice, and you've got the full Alfred build, including his helmet. Which is just the, tr the pyramid head helmet. And then finally, this is the one I care about. Very cool art. It's a shame they've done it in the armor of the... Oh, is it called Lord of Flame or something? It's one of the Chalice Dungeon bosses. I'm not keen on that armor. Burial Blade though is cool. At attack speed, deal one damage to all other enemies within one space. That makes sense. Quick Carve, Slash Slash. Before attacking, may move any enemies within two spaces into your space. Oh, there we go, that's scythe form. Wait, the non-scythe form hits people within one space? Hmm. Before attacking, may move any enemies within two spaces into your space. Oh, I see, the bit on the bottom is like a quick reference for the other form to remind you. Ah, that makes more sense. Speed 2 slash and then an arcing cleave. At speed slow. A lot of damage though, to be expected. This will be the character we're playing when we solo play through this, incidentally. So then there's enemy stat cards, Merciless Watcher, Large Huntsman, the arms, the guns rather, well, you know what I mean, firearms for the hunters we just take, took a look at, oh, and the Nightmare Apostle, which is the spiders, that's his health card, there's his AI card, he's not really much of a boss in the game, you can kind of ignore him, you can run away from him if you want, like you're not fog walled in. He doesn't have a boss health bar. Not sure why this gets the extra cardboard, but still. Yeah, okay, there's a lot here. Is it sellotaped? Is the question. It is. The one that wasn't must have just been by accident. Let's get this. There we go. So most important things first of all. The Burial Blade Hunter. It seems so short <laughs> compared to all the enemies. I get it though, because it's a Dark Souls trope that the enemies are always larger than you. The Tonatrice Mace Lady. Very nice. The Aline the Crow build with the Blades of Mercy. I've got an old YouTube video up on my gaming channel of me in this exact build fighting Vicar Amelia and using the Oh, whatever the name of the item is, it gives you like a blink teleport, so you you fade away and fade in. And then that's the sword I didn't recognise. Like the true Holy Blade or something? I don't remember there being two versions of the Holy Blade. Maybe I just didn't find it. There's the Kirk Hammer. The moulding on the hammer is a little off. It's going to need cleaned a little bit, but otherwise fantastic. And then the Wheel of Doom. Don't charge it up too many times or you'll kill yourself. Very nice. Oh yeah, that, I recognise that armour. I reckon, I remember the exact location to pick up that armour, but I couldn't tell you what it's called. <laughs> so then we have two of these large lads with the cleavers. I don't really remember these guys. Impressive looking though. Be a good stand-in for a, a demon in 40k, honestly. So get two of them. Four of the, oh these are the, like the harder werewolf guys from the true Yarnum, whatever it's called. They're using that weird rake thing, except it's like the, only the top half of it. Yeah, they're annoying. I don't like them. I don't know why you get four doll miniatures. <laughs> Maybe you get one per player, I guess, but that's the doll from the Hunter's Dream. Ugh, horrible. Oh, the, the spider doesn't want it. There we are. Four little spiders. Truly horrible, disgusting, etc. Ugh, they're so bulbous. Oh, and they make weird noises when you press them because they're spindly legs. Get back in there and never annoy me again. 
four messenger lamps in case you don't want to use like this is just to make the board look nicer use these instead of the tokens if you want same with the chests of which you get two four six eight eight or ten two four six eight yeah eight chests simple enough so these are the so-and-sos that chuck rocks at you i think you start finding them in the whatever the dream area is called for your fight amygdala Ah, uh, yeah, and that's where you meet these guys as well, with the weird sideways faces, yep, because their necks are, like, broken. I should truly appreciate the disgusting design of the enemies from the game. And then finally, the boss, well, the boss, it's not a boss in the game. It dies pretty easy, it's not a boss, etc. But, giant spider, pretty cool looking outer, could almost make that into a throne. Truly disgusting. And something for you to kill. So that is the Blood Moon box, but there is still the Chalice Dungeon expansion. So the Chalice Dungeons are optional, semi-randomised stuff you can do in Bloodborne. I think most people just wait until their like, end game to rush through these. So what does this actually add? Four more potential hunters to play as. Bunch of new enemies. Oh, this must be bosses because it includes the Bride. Or whatever her name is. Uh, gives players an entirely new way to experience the game instead of playing a campaign that lets people participate in one-shot hunts. Maybe a good way to learn the game actually then, starting with this and doing one-shot hunts. It also adds a PvP mode because there's a PvP screen. And there is five bosses. Okay. Interesting. Let's get this off. I never much did the Chalice Dungeons myself. I, I did them a little bit but not fully. I watched a friend play all of them. So additional rules. Because this will be the PvP stuff, presumably. And there's Chalice Dungeon Traps. Two pages, including credits. Fair enough. So we have the Chalice Dungeon tiles. They work exactly the same as the base game, down to symbols, etc. They're going to fall out as immediately as I pick them up. Arena gates, yeah, you need to find the lever each time to get down to the next floor. And then every three floors there's a boss. So yeah, which characters are well, There's the PvP screens. I used that screenshot as my thumbnail for my blind playthrough, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, Hunter versus Hunter Combat. Not something I'll be dabbling in, but nice to have regardless, I suppose. So yeah, four, four more Hunters. So we have the Beast Claw. Doesn't that transform you? Yeah, you grow like a mutant hand. <laughs> and you transform it. Chikage which is the katana that saps your blood, I think. Isn't that the one you stab yourself with? Yep, you stab yourself with you to make you do more damage, because blood equals damage. Stake driver, oh, that's a gun build then. That's like the, yeah, it's like a shovel on the end of a, a harpoon launcher. Oh, oh, and that's when you detonate it. Interesting, that's a unique way to, to play it. And then the rifle spear, not a weapon I particularly used. Makes you look like Jim from Blood Bowl a little bit in that picture. Hmm, that's a bit more of a traditional thing. You can impale. It seems. Oh, that's a really fast weapon. Yeah, like 2 2 1. Oh, wait, no. One is slow. Gotta remember, more arrows is better. Oh, sorry. Hit the camera there. So the enemy stat cards for the enemies added in the Chalice Dungeon expansion. Bell Ringers, they're the annoying ones that summon enemies constantly. Rabid Dogs. And then... Oh, boss cards, Beast Possessed Soul. Oh yeah, I remember him. Yeah, he was one of the generic bosses you can find in the Chalice Dungeon. There's like a giant fire dog, but it doesn't seem like that was included here. Just put that to one side. Again, some unnecessary additional cardboard, honestly to one side. We've got the boss AI cards, guillotine. Oh, that's a trap for the Chalice Dungeon. So yeah, that's your AI cards. Oh, let's start here then. So we've got four scorpions. In the Chalice Dungeons I did never ran into many of them. They poison, so they're annoying. Isn't she a boss? Isn't she wearing the armor that the Burial Blade character is wearing? I thought you only fought one of them, but there's five here. So I guess you can fight multiple eventually once you go down deep enough. I actually think the armor looks better on there than the, the hunter. And then there's the one we were just talking about, the beast possessed soul. 
basically a goat demon. Would not look out of place in a Doom game. Four bell ringers, the annoying ladies who summon immortal enemies that keep coming back until you kill her, or find and kill her. Four rabid doggos. I'm surprised these aren't in the base game, considering you've run into the rabid doggos with the villagers very frequently. But hey, they're here. And then the four hunters themselves. So that's the beast claw, including beast hand. Stake driver. Very nice. I haven't really noticed a single problem with any of these miniatures. The Shikage. Or Chikage. Oh no, this is the stake driver. That was the other thing. I think. They're both like stake weapons. I never use them. Blood tinge build were not my bag, baby. Let's get that to one side. Get the lid off. Oh, that's some impressive looking enemies. So we've got four giant rats. Simple enough. They look absolutely disgusting. They all look quite fun painted. I can tell just by how horrible they are. These, I don't remember these, but these are like the... Oh, these are like the wounded doggos with knives in their mouth. And porcupine spikes. Disturbing. And then this is... Oh, I don't really remember this guy. He looks like the guy from Dark Souls 3. That guards the bridge to the, the Frost Sea. Very neat. I just I don't remember him in Bloodborne. Maybe he's Chalice Dungeon specific and I didn't get far enough. So then we have our bosses. This is the bride boss who you would normally meet just before fighting Murgo's wet nurse in terms of like the main story. But I know you can fight and kill her in the Chalice Dungeons. And she's very difficult as I understand it. <laughs> but as I say I didn't get that far. I only watched a friend do it so I didn't have to suffer. Him I also do not remember, but it's a very cool looking miniature with two sickles. Very nice. So I, I think I mentioned at the top that this is not everything that's available. There was a bunch of expansions basically for each section of the game. I think they retail at like £40 each. If the game is fun enough, I might get them in the future. Once they're at retail. Yeah, I remember this guy being one of the optional bosses as well. His back is covered in candles. Hmm. <laughs> Neat. And then these, I remember these being at... Actually, let's take out the other one, it's easier. <laughs> you do find these in the Chalice Dungeons, but primarily, I think, in the main story, you find them outside Bergenrith, or whatever the, the school was called. Again, very freaky looking, very cool. I imagine they look quite neat painted. They're so weird looking, but that's on purpose. That's part of the, the, the nice thing about Bloodborne. So that is everything you get, both in the base box for the Bloodborne board game, and also everything you got if you back to Kickstarter at the, the Blood Moon level, so that's the stretch goals plus the, the Blood Moon stuff and Murgle's Loft and the Chalice Dungeons. Let me know, because you'll be seeing this on Friday, I think. Do you want me just to get jump straight in? Or would you rather wait until I paint it up enough to do a painted, like, one scenario? Chalice Dungeon or otherwise, I'm not sure what the rulebook will suggest in terms of like... Well, you should probably start with this because it's relatively easier so to speak, although you do die a lot from what I've seen. You let me know. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try this. I loved Bloodborne, the video game. I'm hoping the same can be said for the miniature game. Thanks for watching. See you next time. It's tough for now.